Welcome to the Motoring Podcast, your weekly discussion of motoring news. This is episode 584 on Tuesday, the 25th of June, 2024. Hello, I'm Alan. Hello, I'm Andrew. And this week we'll be seeing some feel it's good to talk. In new new car news, we see some cars returning, which we'd all better go out and buy. And in points of interest, we share some sensible policies for a happier Brit. <laughs> but first, we have a smidgen of follow up, and it is the news that the tariffs that the EU wants to impose has caused the Chinese and EU senior people to actually realize perhaps is now a good time to grab the phone and chat to each other and see if they can thrash this out properly like sensible people. It's good to talk. Yes, quite. Uh, so <laughs> they are thrashing out between them. In the meantime, China, however, um, is offering, could offer German car makers who are against this because, of course, they're the ones who are building all the EVs in China and then wanting to bring them back again. They could offer them other perks to try to offset the EV levies, like dropping the, the levies that are on large engine internal combustion vehicles and things, all sorts of stuff that will benefit the, the German car makers. Mm. China want the tariffs to be removed while they, have, they start this uh, consultation, apparently. Not quite what they're going to be consulting. It's more of a negotiation, I would feel, at this point. <laughs> yes. Both sides made it very clear where they wish to stand. <laughs> yeah. Of course, just Stellantis don't really build in China and bring back. That means that France and Italy are on one side going, ha ha, we don't want it. You know, they want to sell low priced, relatively low priced EVs. I mean, we, we talked the other week about the Citroën Ami being built in Morocco and these kind of things. Mm. Uh, these kind of other countries, whereas the Germans have just set up, set up EV building shop in China and are bringing it back. I think there's a certain amount of internal discussion and debate in there. I'm, I'm sure we'll copy whatever it is that the EU does. Yeah, the politicians are trying to play it a little bit both ways. They're pri they're trying to show that they're protecting EU workers, mm. but equally saying, "But our doors are open if you want to come and build a factory here." We're perfectly fine if you want to do that and employ some of our voters and we can say, look what we've done to give you more jobs. Which is fair enough because mm. that's the better, that is actually the, the, the better outcome for everyone yes. uh, involved. And, you know, you can't really, can't really argue with that. No. Uh, talking of Italy, though, Alan, do you want to, do you want to take us to the naughty step? Yes. And it, in new news, it is new news this week. Yes. Is Italian firm DR. Now, DR don't sell in the UK. They never have sold in the UK. Mostly been Italy only. Now, some of you might remember, though, having seen them, they had a stand at Geneva quite a few years ago. And it was relatively big, but it was in the corner and everybody was kind of wondering past going, what on earth is that? Turns out what they are are rebadged cheeries. They're not just cheeries these days. For a long time, they were rebadged cheeries. They're also JEC and BAIC cars, but they are brought in from China, and then there is a factory, and something happens in the factory, and it might, it might be a bit like the Lada one used to be in Hull, where basically they stripped down and rebuilt the Ladas so that they wouldn't actually fall apart. And I don't know, I think, it's, I think they do sort of refinishing and sticking on of DR badges yes. at this factory in Italy. Uh, however, that has been deemed... By the Italian government. Well, by the EU, actually. The EU themselves. Oh, you're quite right. It is the EU, pardon me. Uh, that this does not count as made in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who'd have thought it? Uh, they are actually going to fight this immediately. And the founder, Dericio, has said that um, we fully dispute the decision or are about to challenge it. Yes, exactly. They have finally, by the way, broken into one of Italy's top 20 brands. They sold 32,650 new cars, market share of 2.1%, which is year-on-year -year growth of 34%. It seems like quite a lot of that, though, certainly last summer, was in the rental car market. Because mm. I know a few people, both from the internet and in real life, who went to Italy and ended up with DRs as rental cars. I believe at least one returned it to the rental company going, can I have something which is actually a car, please? <laughs> Words to that effect. Because not good. I've seen them on the streets before in Milan and stuff. They are cheap. But I think that that's the best thing they've got going for them is cheap. Mm. I'm going to take us to BMW. And they have announced that they have cancelled their $2 billion battery cell contract with Northvolt 
because North Vault were not going to hit the time scales that were agreed in 2020. The two companies will continue to work together, and I'm quoting here from the BMW uh, statement that is reported by Reuters, um, that they have a strong interest in establishing a high-performance manufacturer of circular and sustainable battery cells in Europe. They're going to replace them with Samsung, Samsung SDI, uh, and this one. Now, there's one thing that's, that's worth pointing out about this story is that Northvolt has multiple battery plants. These batteries, which have been giving trouble, it seems, were from the plant in Sweden. They just haven't been able to get it right, mm. it seems. They are still being, we are still working with North, Northvolt for the Neue class EVs and the batteries for there. They're meant to come from Northvolt too. That's from a different factory in Heide in northern Germany. Whilst they've dropped out of this contract with Northvolt, they are still looking to use Northvolt, but maybe different battery configuration, different factory. Mm. Yeah, I don't know whether they were the ones who were going to supply the, uh, the, the cylindrical batteries. Because remember that, that brought the inbuilt advantage of allowing airflow and cooling. I think loads of people use cylindrical batteries. Mm. I know Tesla do and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, because it always seems weird to start with because you think, well, why don't you get something that tessellates? But then, of course, you need the coolant to flow through it, and that's what cylindrical ones give you just a little bit of a touch. And then, of course, most of the the, the biggest exposure to cooling, yeah, liquids, air, whatever it is you're using. But we'll have to keep a, an eye on North Fault because that's quite a large contract to suddenly come off the books for projected mm-hmm. forecasts and investment and R and D. Hopefully that doesn't harm them, but also I think it underlines that we are still so early into EVs and the technology. Yes. I mean, there may well be another manufacturer who comes along, steps in, and, and scoops up most of that. Because mm. people are really looking for battery capacity. Yep. There may be a silver lining in that one, but not at the minute. Do you want to take us to MOTs? And this has nothing to do with trying to make them 10 years between, or anything silly like that. No, no, this one's quite interesting. Um, the Department for Transport, has been looking at how the MOT, uh, so the, the Ministry of Transport Roadworthiness test, should should or could evolve in the future to make, to still be relevant and to make sure it is checking the safety of a vehicle. Part of that is to look to, to see how you could include checks on ADAS and safety systems to make sure that systems still continue to work over the life of the car and that it's not leaving drivers at risk. There's just a couple of challenges on here. Um, that as there being different bits are being mandated, A, can you include stuff that wasn't mandatory, all these sorts of things. And then there's there's lots of other bits and pieces, like there's a paragraph here in this AM Online article which says, the DFT notes that the present ADAS systems and even their terminology, in inverted commas, are not standardized, and this makes it difficult to assess accurately what percentage of vehicles are already fitted with the devices. The other thing is, I, I don't know... You, well, <sighs> I know that you found it. So many different manufacturers, different standards of ADAS system out of the box. Mm. And what would happen if the absolute standard manufacturer shipped ADAS system actually doesn't meet whatever it is that the Department for Transport puts in place as the test? Yeah, because how are they going to test it as well? Yeah. Are they testing it on a test track, which is... Look, mom, no hand. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of difficult for your average MOT station to be able to do. Yeah. Um, I can see them doing visual inspections of sensors, mm-hmm. i.e. there shouldn't be a crack in them or, you know, something like that. Or yeah, missing. no warning lights. That is understandable. But beyond that, I'm not sure how they can do this. I don't know if they can do calibration or anything like that, but especially as some of them use one technology, some of them use another technology, a standardized calibration set's not really going to work. It's some interesting questions. I, I had another thing that came out of this as well, by the way, mm. which we discussed beforehand, and this is a bit of a tangent. But it's tests for vehicles straight out of the factory. Yes. Partly for this kind of thing, partly for other stuff that I've seen, news really from vehicles that aren't sold in Europe and won't be sold in Europe, about quality straight from the factory. And I've seen reports recently of vehicles shipping with non-working windscreen wipers. These kinds of things. Uh, not just not just that, but people accepting them. And other stuff, like those comments, I've seen comments from both sides of the Atlantic about headlamp aiming mm. in new vehicles. And it did make me wonder, 
why there's no test for that before a vehicle goes on the road? Because it's assumed that a factory is going to assemble stuff properly and build it and test it and aim it. But we've seen that isn't the case. If you're really pursuing cost, you're really driving down cost, then you're not going to bother, are you? There's no, but, but there's I think nothing we've, we've seen ob- that obligating though, you to do that, haven't we? We've seen that with the scandal in Japan mm. that they get certificated beforehand and it is presumed they are following yeah. that same perfect system all mm-hmm. the way through for all of them. Yes. There are some brands that are clearly not doing the same standard mm. each and every car. Yeah. And stuff does happen as well. Let's, let's yes, be ab- realistic because there are humans involved. That you, problems will just crop up through just life and the way things are. Mm. We mm-hmm. have to accept yeah. that. It will be interesting to know what is a manufacturer's testing process yeah. at the end of it because they have to do something won't they because it would cost them so much to take them back in you'd think so wouldn't you yeah but it was sorry it was just the whole these things are so different some of them are really good some of them are absolute rubbish uh, how can you tell the difference and and given that there are no real standards around these things how can you then test if there is no standard that you should be standardizing against yeah uh, which is a minimum level of requirements so, sorry anyway Enough of the tangent. Let's move back on. Buses, Andrew. Electric yeah. buses. Yeah, Right Bus has uh, launched something called New Power, which is a program to convert diesel buses to electric. Their own buses, that is. And the idea is that they're going to be priced at around £200,000 to do this, and the picture just shows a um, typical double-decker bus. I'm presuming that price is for the larger buses, nothing small. And and what they will do is they will remove the powertrain of the diesel, insert all the gubbings that are required to make it EV, and they are hoping to target operators that have got midlife buses, not when they come to end of life and then doing it. Yeah, when they become end of life and they're really polluting and nasty, then they're used to to transport school children. Yeah, yeah, it's because that's time. what you really want—the really old polluty buses around all the kids. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Never understood that. It's one thing, it's something that America actually does much better. Mm. But they are hoping that that cost of £200,000, which is apparently a lot less than a brand new EV, dedicated EV bus, will encourage more people to take up and uh, get the fleet, the UK fleet, in, in greener, quicker. Mm-hmm. Interesting thing about this is that the work is taking place in the former, well, it's in, in the new power facility in Oxfordshire, which used to be the headquarters of Arrival. That's been quite a quick turnaround from bankrupt company to... Um, has new life. To has new life and, and it looks uh, to be more sustainable as well. Yep. Last thing before we get to Guilt Minute, Caterham. Caterham has built a new factory. It is not far away from its old factory, which is great because that means it's got all the same people yes. working there, or most of the same people, because that's nice. And it is purpose-built. It is shiny. It has all the kit in all the stations. It has 33 build stations. Mm. They can be building, constructing up to 33 caterings at a time. Still capped at a maximum capacity of 750 vehicles a year, because that means that they retain their tiny little manufacturer. Yes. Allocation, which is what you want. But supposedly the previous factories were quite dated and gloomy and that this is a world apart. So the, all the build floor is on the, is I don't know if it's underground or it's, it's on the ground floor. Uh, and then up above are some of the offices, some of the, the spares, there's a sort of dealership space as well and a, a show off space for stuff, all of which overlooks the factory floor so you can look down and see stuff happening as well and then up above that there's offices and all the other all the other stuff that you would expect really i think it's really cool mm-hmm. Fifty-four thousand square feet if that means anything to you and it was all funded by caterham's owner vt holdings japanese company uh, it took nine months to fit out and it does all of the motorsport and all the commercial stuff as well all on one location all on one location is so important because it means people can actually speak to each other yes that's how you get the most of open plan offices is that you enable, not ripping out walls and sticking everyone in one giant room, is you enable them to intermingle with each other Mm. naturally during the day. Yes. This is great news because we all want Caterham to thrive. We want them to do well. This is excellent. 
Uh, and they say that they will be looking at other markets that they haven't been able to pursue up to now because of constraints of production. Yeah. Well, they've still got production constraints, but not in the same kind of way they've done overall. Yeah. That brings us, though, to Guild Minute, the quick break in the show where we ask for a tad of financial support to keep the lights on and the hosting running. If you feel the Motion Podcast is worth a small consideration every month, then you can become a patron. Different levels of patron include different levels of commitment from us to you, including being able to watch the show recorded live. We also have a small range of merchandise in our spring store from stickers to mugs and t-shirts. If you don't have any spare cash and we do completely understand, then you can help us by following for free from a podcast player to receive every show as they're released and by liking and rating the show in whatever way your podcast supplier lets you. If you've done all of that, and some of you do, so thank you very much, then the last thing you can do is to recommend us to your friends or colleagues. Thank you, everyone that does. Very much appreciated. Hmm. Okay, it's new, new car news, and ring the church bells, light the beacons, Volvo are bringing back estates. Hurrah! Flex your checkbooks, everyone. Well, yes, that is the important bit. The Volvo V60 and V90 will return because there has been a resurgence, according to this autocar article, that is linked in the show notes, a resurgence in demand. I wonder how they calculate that. Yeah. Was it that enough people went, well, I would prefer this, but I'm going to take the SUV equivalent? But salespeople aren't very good at passing that kind of information back because all they want to do is sell the SUV equivalent. Are Volvo now an uh, agency model, though? I don't know. And I don't know that that would make any difference to salesmen because salesmen are like that. But if something's not there, you can't choose the option, so you never know how many you're missing. Mm, yeah. I wondered when I originally saw this if it was to do with the police actually wanted them. That's a good point. Uh, that was my initial consideration, hence my question last week about does a police car get counted as an actual car mm. uh, when it's registered or not, because then... It must do at some I was, point, because they sell them, don't they? Yeah, because I was wondering if their powertrains and stuff, if they're going for a petrol or plug-in hybrid, uh, like these two are now being ava- uh, are now being made available in, if that counted against the CO2 calculations or not. Mm-hmm. Because you know how emergency response vehicles and all these things aren't covered, but by some of the forthcoming legislation around stuff, you'll still be able to have a petrol-powered fire, oh, no, diesel-powered fire engine and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really the, what I'm the saying. The European stuff is saying that the, um, the, the heavy fleet must be um, decarbonized. That's where I was coming from with this. If it's a responder vehicle, does it does it count towards that? Because it's still yeah. an emergency services vehicle. Sorry. Uh, again, again, I, I start my day much later than you guys do, so I come in halfway through conversations and have these ooh, ooh whenever yeah, I, I first check stuff in the morning. But the V60 is going to come uh, with a um, choice of either a two-litre mild hybrid uh, with a petrol engine or a couple of petrol uh, FEVs. The larger V90 is only coming as a FEV, though. Mm -hmm. Prices are yet to be confirmed, but when they were on sale, the V60 started at 47750 for the mild hybrid and 57580 as a fev that's still that's quite chunky and the v90 cost uh, the v90 fev cost 62220 i presume they'll be similar if probably a little bit up yes inflation etc we all went oh woe is us they're taking away estates we love estates well buy them then that's the only way yeah. that they keep bringing us these things the only way you can do it is to buy them new by the way so you can't just sit there and go, oh, it's awfully expensive. I'm going to wait till they're second hand. Well, if they don't sell any new, they can't sell any second hand. Get out there and flex your PCPs if this is your kind of thing. Yep. I know it's not possible for everyone. Like me. Uh, <laughs> anyway, do you want to take us, unfortunately, to BMW now? Yes. Uh, the autocar headline on this is Bald new BMW X3 boasts Fev range and keeps the diesel. Uh, it does. It has it has a fev range, and it does keep the diesel. But whether or not you describe it as bold or ugly is down to you, I guess. I'm going with ugly. I'm going with pretty repulsive. It's it's another example of what is happening with BMW's design. Did I write this or did I just think this quite hard the other day about marketing led companies where no longer is stuff engineering led? It's very much marketing led. And it's marketing, 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 and I don't know what they're smoking. Well, we were discussing or last was week it where that it, you, you were explaining how sometimes marketing's winning, sometimes 
and because it was about Bob Lutz in his. Ah, oh, that's true. Yes, I knew I'd had it at some point. Sorry. I find at the moment I'm talking to many people about similar things, and so one thing runs into another. <laughs> I think it's my age. This is like three or four different cars stuck together. Badly. It is most like, yeah, somebody who's got an original one series with this sort of weird swoopy bit, and they have shoved a large straw up its exhaust pipe, and they have inflated it. Yes, and it's not inflated evenly either, And it? it's not inflated evenly. It's all sort of bulgy and, mm. and lumpy. I don't know what the heck is going on with the wheel arches, but it's as if they have been designed specifically to make wheels look tiny. It's this awful top-heavy and back-heavy thing. It's just, oh, the original X5 is such a good-looking vehicle, and it's 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 all this cellulite not, and is, yuck and just terrible. gross. I'm sorry, it's going to sell really well. There will be a pure electric X3 as well, which I'm sure will be an iX3. Yeah, that's next year. It will come next year, but this is an evolution of the current one. It sells very well. The previous model sells very well. 350,000 global sales. You know, that's not to be sniffed at. But they've made it bigger, longer, wider. They've revamped the interior. They've done what they've done to the exterior, unfortunately. Yeah. I get the feeling that this will look better in the base spec rather than the higher specs, but everyone will get the higher specs. Because you look through the pictures in this autocar article and it gets grimmer and grimmer <laughs> as you go through. It really does. I would love to be able to say, I like that design from BMW, but I haven't been able to say that for quite a few years now. It's um, uh, My father's had countless BMWs, mm. and just right at the minute, and he's saying, don't want any of them. Don't yeah. want them. Uh, anyway, this range, the lowest... Priced ones will start at £46,800 for the X-Drive 20. Get a Volvo V60 instead. <laughs> Climbs to 48210 for the X-Drive 20D, which is clearly the, the fleet one. Will anybody choose it? Yeah, no, no, they're still going to... The, the thing is, the interesting thing is they are going to keep doing a diesel. This is the one that does the diesel, yeah. the the And then it's at 56340 for the X-Drive 30E plug-in hybrid, uh, which has, can now travel more than 50 miles on electric power. And then there's an X3 M50 at 64,990, which has almost 400 horsepower, and a 3 litre, 3 6. And there will be an X3 M returning next year. Oh, if you like that kind of thing. And the interior, with all the illuminated bits, is as good as the outside. It's just sad. I just think it's really ugly and it's such a shame. And I'm sure it'll drive beautifully and all these things, but goodness me, what a dog's dinner. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Well, uh, I'm going gonna... to <laughs> from the sublime to the ridiculous. Yes, but not. But not no. Yeah. I'm going to take us to the Bugatti Tourbillon. Sorry, I've got to. I can't. Go on. Can't you let pronounce that go. it. I thought I was doing okay. It's Tourbillon because ah, okay. it's French term, so it's a Y instead oh, of so double there's, L. There's no L's. Tourbillon. Yeah. Oh, okay. The it's like famille. Tourbillon. The, the equivalent is the French word famille. F A M I L L E, which means family. So oh, it's a thank you. I've learned something today. Yes. Do you know I what Tourbillon is? In a moment. No, no idea. Tourbillon is a part in a mechanical watch movement that, j that you see jiggling back and forth. It's often shown off in the dial, which helps it keep better, better time. It sort of smooths out the, 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 the sort of spring and any movements within, within mm. the watch. And they can be multi jeweled and all sorts of fun stuff. Cool. I've learned two things now. We haven't even got into the story. So I this well, this car with its with its fancy name that I can't pronounce <laughs> is going to cost three point two million. Currently has a top speed of two hundred and seventy six miles per hour and uses a V sixteen hyper hybrid power plant engine thingy. And it comes to us twenty years after the launch of the Veyron, which was and still is an amazing feat of engineering hmm. and bloody mindedness. <laughs> and so is the Tourbillon, by the way. Yes. Absolutely. What's it? We will pick bits of this apart in a moment, but I have to say, I think the exterior is actually uh, quite nice looking. And I love the fact that they have obviously done so much between design and engineering and got them together and made them work together so hard because there's so many little aero bits, not only just to keep it on the road, but also to make sure that it doesn't cook its engine. So there's thermal dynamics as well as aero, all involved in 
all these little touches that the more you look at the car, you notice. It's a wonderful piece of engineering and packaging. It mm. really, it truly is. Till you get to the inside. Well, the other thing, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. So it's a wonderful piece of engineering and packaging. Cool thing to note, the W16 it's very unusual, but as well as that, this one has been engineered in collaboration with Cosworth. Go British Engineering. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of Northampton in every single tube. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's been engineered along with them. Again, brilliant, brilliant British motorsport heritage and knowledge and all that kind of stuff. The thing is that no matter what our opinions are on this, it's not going to matter a single jot to anyone who can actually afford one. Yeah. Uh, the thing that saddens me about these is that they will never, I mean, there's 250 of them. One of them, two of them might be driven very fast mm. on a racetrack just to do it uh, or to demonstrate stuff, but the vast majority of them will sit in garages or potter about the Middle East, uh, maybe occasionally show up on the KD Berg in Geneva over a summer, but most of them will just be hidden away and, and that wonderful, wonderful engineering and all that effort that's gone into it won't be used. No. That's what makes me sad about. It. That's the thing that I, the thing I dislike about this car is nothing to do with this car because it's it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, I, I love the fact that somebody's done it, and I love the fact that Bugatti continue to do this sort of thing because yeah. anyone who's listened to us for any length of time knows that we feel engineering is really important and we should be pushing boundaries mm. uh, and the likes. It's wonderful that it happens, and it's going to be great that 250 people can afford to buy one of these because it makes the company sustainable, and mm -hmm. it's going to be fantastic when it beats the 300-mile-an-hour attempt yeah. and all the other things they're going to do with one. Yeah. The interior, then, cool. what they've done is they've exposed the insides of the dials and everything to like a watch face. On a watch, you do it so you can see the movement of the, the tourbillon. And the other, and the escarpments and all the other bits and pieces inside a watch. Um, so they've done similar inside, which if you like that kind of watch face is very good, very nice. Uh, if you're not really such a fan and like some of the rest of us, you'd probably prefer the original Lexus IS 200 one with the sort of Seiko <laughs> chronograph style look. It's a little bit more unique inside, but at least there's very little, uh, switch gear you can accuse them of carrying over from a Volkswagen Golf or anything. Yes, that's true. <laughs> One of the other things which I didn't notice until just a little while ago is that this is the steering wheel. Did you notice what's weird about the steering wheel? Uh, the steering wheel spokes. It's, a, the, it's the top and the bottom. The, they're the top and the bottom, but they also reach behind the instrument cluster. Mm. It's a little bit like a Citroen C4 was. Doesn't you know, it doesn't the that stay state? still as well? It, yeah. The middle bit stays still, and it's yeah. just the outside rim that moves, which means that you, you never have anything other than your arms and the way the dials. Which is kind of cool. It's just something that's a bit different. Again, it's a shame it won't be seen very much, especially as I'm sure it's completely drivable in everyday, yeah, everything. That's at, at three point two million. It's got it's got to it's got to be unique in certain areas and not just with the engine plant. And there comes a point, and McLaren did this with the F1 as well. The idea of the F1 was that everything could be remade and rebuilt and refurbished later on, including things like the the dial. And there comes a point where with the screens, the screens are just going to be binnable mm. eventually. And the, the, so what they've done is a move beyond it just being a screen, uh, which I think is, is kind of cool too. But do click the link in the show note because there's an awful lot of information in this autocar article and they speak to several key members from the Bugatti team who explain certain aspects of the car. Would love to see one up close. We'll never see one up close. <laughs> yeah, I did think you... It depends where you go. It, you could quite easily just be wandering through central London and happen to see one up close. It would involve leaving the house. Anyway, do you want to take <laughs> us to Genesis then? Yes, uh, Genesis. More hot, very fast vehicles. 641 brake horsepower from the new Genesis GV60 Magma. It is likely to come to the UK. It is also likely to cost around about £100,000. Yeah, underneath. There's a certain similarity and platform sharing with the um, Hyundai, I've now forgotten the name, uh, Ionic 5N. I got the 5N, I just couldn't remember what went before it. The Ionic 5N, 89 kilowatt hour battery, 641 horsepower, dual motor drivetrain. It should be able to get about 278 miles 
of range and or a 3.460 not to 62 mile sprint. Yeah, I hope it comes in that orange. I think that's, you know, like the Ionic baby blue. Yeah. This uh, sorry, is the-, the N baby blue. I think this orange is the magma because what they're also going to do is they're not putting magma on as a badge. They're just blackening out the Genesis badges. Everything. I love the wheels on this concept. Again, this is, yeah, the wheels are fantastic. Again, this is a cracking article in Autocar where they speak to several people, including um, Donk Volk himself, who goes on to go into detail about certain things. And you, you I get the feeling that this was a, a really interesting part of the conversation because of the words he uses and how it's phrased. I think he was making a point. Yes. <laughs> would have been great to have been there to watch that. <laughs> it is actually wonderfully pretentious. <laughs> um, will anyone buy a Genesis for £100,000? Uh, we will have it's to wait and one. see. We will have to tough wait one. and see. I was admiring a G70 the other day. Mm. Came up behind me. Past and I was sitting there thinking, that's a nice looking car. But then yeah. they are relatively popular. I do see quite a few GV70s, GV80s. Right, so speaking of other new brands. Ah, yes. Mm, yes, a new brand. JLR has revived the Freelander name, and this is now going to be a new standalone brand. In the House of Bran. Not in the House of Bran. House of Brands always feels like it should be something hosted in the early evening by Richard Osman. <laughs> but it is not going to be part of the House of Brands because this is going to be a standalone brand in China, initially, with their partner Cherry. Uh, their joint venture partner, where they are going to build electrified cars in China for initially China, and then the plan is to hopefully then start exporting them around the world with no idea whether that would be the UK or not. I suspect not at the moment, but there's going to be more platform sharing and technology sharing, and apparently the wonderful name of Freelander will help open doors and bring people flocking to whatever the car is it's going to be because it isn't going to be what autocar have provided no autocar's pic the picture at the top of the autocar article it even says hidden further down in the autocar article that that is a picture from 2020 basing a freelander idea off uh off an ipace platform hence the form uh, is kind of ipace ish because that's what the picture was underneath freelander uh, uh, unlikely in north america and europe because the freelander name got so trashed by reliability woes that they dropped it hence it became the discovery sport eventually in the U- in europe and most of the world and then for that they'd already dropped it in north america to make it the lr2 because they dropped discovery and freelander to make lr2 and lr3 in an attempt to move on from previous challenges with reliability mm-hmm. let's see what happens with this ties in of course with the announcement that JLR and Cherry were going to work together on electrified platforms, mm-hmm. Jaguar will be able to use their platforms for this Freelander project. Uh, sorry, the Freelander EV portfolio, uh, as it says in the, in the JLR press release. That is the problem when you discuss JLR stuff at the moment, is that it's so, so poncy posy. The Freelander portfolio represents complementary growth. Yeah, and the house of brands and all that. It's like, okay, any chance we can see some cars soon, please? <laughs> Just something. Yeah. Jaguar? Something to, give us, Jaguar? something to give us some hope. Who remembers Jaguar? Anyone? <laughs> I mean, the, the, as I say, that they are the, the current thing. Sorry, let's balance here. Mm. Do my BBC bit. Current range is selling, seems to be selling very well, certainly in northeastern USA. I, the an exponential rise in the number of new house of what the hell do you call it these days new discovery and range rover defender cars mm. badged vehicles which may or may not also say land rover on them but that's not a brand anymore because it's a brand um and it's uh, i thought we'd be in balance to haunting <laughs> Um, the, but there's, there's more of them. That's good. Yay. Yeah. Go British engineering and manufacturing where appropriate. Yep. I failed miserably at trying to be super positive there, didn't I? Let's forget new car news now then. Let's move on to points of interest because we don't need to be balanced there because all of it's good. Oh, nicely done. Lunchtime read this week is on Haggerty. 
It is by Matteo Licata. It's about a five minute read and it's the rise and fall of Turin's design firms. Whatever happened to the big brands, the, the those big design houses that we used to see all the time, Bertone's Pinaferinas. Why are they all so quiet these days? Mm. And yeah, great piece uh, explaining just the differences and then what happened and then uh, and then how other car manufacturers played them off each other without necessarily ever actually investing. Well worth five minutes of your time. It, it's Matteo. It's, it's always going to be good. Yeah. And some cracking photos as well. Yeah, yeah, I love those. Okay, list of the week is from Autocar. It is a slideshow. And this week, I have to say, it works perfectly well for me. I don't know if it works for Alan. It hands up perfectly well so far. Excellent. Thank you, Autocar, for whatever it, whatever you've done. 20 clicks in, and uh, now I'm talking, it's probably all going to mess up, but it now seems to work perfectly in Firefox. Thank you so much. Yes. For those of you who keep me abreast of technical changes in the background of the Autocar website, uh, yes, thank you. Yes, we do appreciate your efforts. We really do. We really do. <laughs> Alan, this slideshow is called The 60 Most Beautiful Cars Ever Made, which I think is stretching it a little with one or two of it's them. It's not bad, but it's, it's there's, yeah. Um, the well, challenge well, how is we are you do going? these Are you going off. cliched or are you going something a little I'm bit I'm trying to choose something though? I know. that so Because this list, I mean, we do try and not to repeat lists too much, but the, this one, there have been similar over the last little while. Mm. It's a case of there are some that I always gravitate towards, and then there's others which I am trying right at the moment as I click uh, like mad and it's still working to choose something slightly different. Um, do you know what? That's what I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose the BMW i8 because I really love the BMW i8. It still, to me, looks like the future. I have a funny feeling the one that's pictured is even the one I've driven. I, I saw one the other day and I thought, God, that looks so good. Can't believe that's a former model. And isn't it depressing? When we yeah, don't. I just, I hadn't, I just hadn't. You know, I thought that, and I didn't. That was before we put the, the things together, and I said it just there without thinking, and it was like, oh, whoops. Yeah, it, is, and it does. It does. That's that's the problem. That's not that. What was it seven, eight years ago? Mm-hmm. It, it yeah, really so it's twenty fourteen, and twenty fourteen is in there. That's a ten year old car. Ten year old car, and it looks so much better than anything else they've got to oh, offer yeah. us. It's yeah. Sorry, that wasn't. Sad. That was not a genuinely not intentional. Andrew, there are 62 pictures here. Well, I'm going to make it worse. I'm going to make it worse because I'm going to go for the 1956 BMW 507. Ah, now you're doing that. um, You're not even doing that on purpose, really, are you? It's beautiful. Um, I've forgotten the name now. I wanted to step away from from Jags, Ferraris, uh, all that sort of usual stuff. There was an Alpha there. There were two Alphas there. And I thought, no, I'm sure we've chosen those ones before. Yeah, but yeah, no, the five hundred seven obviously reflected again the in the Z eight. That one does have echoes of a Z eight, unlike the the recent sort of flabby thing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful car. Yeah, but there are tons for you to pick from. The six sixty two slides <laughs> for you lot to go through and let us know if you would go all BMW like we have or what else you pick. Mm-hmm. As ever, I didn't know what Andrew was going to choose beforehand, no, and he I has chosen you one. Well through the list as well. Right, Alan, do you want to take us on to... Uh, and look, I know this... You've not had to deal with it as much no, as we are, no, but no, you no, have no, your... No, 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 no. no, no. Let no, me finish. No, no, you no, have your no. own one to I, I have with. both of them. I get right. both. Now, this election was in the UK is called, and it was a snap one, but it feels like it's been going on for about a decade now, and we are nearly at the end of it. However, I think we have found the manifesto in which we can all get on board with and we should all be voting for if only there was proportional representation yes. <laughs> take us take us to petrol block <laughs> yes the petrol block party uh, election manifesto has been put forward by its chairman gavin big surname and it has a number of uh, it has uh, what is it five ten it has ten different sections of the manifesto which are clear concise uh, and I think give a fair deal for, for everyone. It's a bit lenient in a few of them, but yes. <laughs> I am not disagreeing with any in this manifesto. No, I, I can't disagree with any of them either. But I, there's just nothing I can say that's not going to give away. No, you have to click the link in the show notes. You do have to read this. One of my favourites, okay, I'll say section nine, that the use of POA on car adverts is to be banned. What's the punishment? If a car is for sale, it needs a price. Anyone caught flouting the law will be forced to watch reruns of the Chris Evans era of Top Gear. I mean, 
harsh punishments for harsh crimes. <laughs> As that historical documentary Blackadder showed us, yeah, uh, sensible policies for a happier Britain. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There will also in the show notes be a uh, nearly five minute video from Petrol Blog because Gavin Big Surname has a, he's waffling a little bit as he likes to. And that's a term of endearment, not a Well, we can hardly hassle him for that, can we? No, well, he calls it waffle anyway, doesn't he? Yeah. He is talking about how Petrol Blog is going to be coming back with a bang soon and explaining what he's been up to and how seriously, thankfully, and we can see that every, every time an, uh, an edition comes out, he is taking the classic car and retro. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, sorry, I, I, I just noticed one of the previous stories here from, from May. 2024, which is Happy Traffic Jam Stocked Photo Weekend, which uh, <laughs> basically, especially whenever the, the photos have clearly been taken about 15 years beforehand. Yes. Yeah, I think that that is, is that us for this week? Anything else that we've missed? for this week. No. Nope, yes, quite a so. lot of shouting and ranting this week. Sorry about that. Well, no, we were just sad. I think a lot, a lot yeah, of it was sadness. Uh, uh, upset, let down and disappointed yeah. rather than angry. But if you've been upset, let down, and disappointed, uh, don't forget that between now and next week, you can give us any feedback, share your thoughts on the show at Motoring Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, on Facebook, and on the contact page of motoringpodcast.com, the hub of all our activities. Uh, remember, you can support us financially via Patreon, and please leave a review and rating on Apple Podcasts or however your podcast app lets you do such a thing. Andrew, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Best way to get in touch with me is if you search for Crap Windscreen on Twitter or Mastodon, or you can find me on LinkedIn under my real name if you wish to connect there alan if people want to get in touch with you personally what's the best way for them to do that can i endorse you <laughs> hmm. that sounds seedy <laughs> it does. linkedin yeah endorse you for breathing well done um if you want to get in touch with me the best way is to use twitter or indeed any of the other social media platforms used by people over the age of 35 and on all of those i am at AJP Bradley. That's B R A D L E Y. As you said, we'll be back very soon. But until then, I've been Alan Bradley. I've been Andrew Clues. And safe motoring.